Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, many thanks to, to John and the team at UXDX for, for inviting me to, to talk to you today. Uh, first and foremost, I'm not a product manager, and I'm probably speaking well beyond uh, my expertise, but I wanted to do that thing that Rory mentioned, which is talk about use cases. So I wanted to give you a sense for how we plan technology development, how we plan our internal platform at King, and how we aid the game developers who work inside of King to, to ship those games. So let me just first off do a very quick introduction to myself. So I've been working in and around the game industry for many years, I've been involved in a number of startups, uh, starting with Havoc and then most recently Swerve. Uh, and only recently in the last two years, I've joined King. And I suppose what I wanted to draw a conclusion from here was my history of working with these companies was largely in a B2B mode. Uh, a business enterprise servicing other business companies or, or customers. Swerve was a sort of a SaaS product and Havoc was more of a, nearly not quite a packaged good, but a library and SDK product. But ultimately all our customers were always business uh, businesses and companies. With King, it's different. So King is ostensibly a B2C company. We create computer games, uh, mobile games, but internally we're operating or we try to operate as a, a B2B product delivery organization delivering our product internally to our internal customers, which are the game teams. So I'm going to come back to that. That's essentially the theme of the talk, which is how do we configure ourselves in that way to deliver efficiently to the game teams? But first off, a little bit about King. So for those of you who don't know, um, King is a company um, founded in, in Sweden, in Stockholm, in 2003. Uh, its biggest success so far has been the Candy Crush game, Candy Crush Saga. Huge success, launched in 2012, and it shot the company uh, to start them directly afterwards. It went public in 2014 and was subsequently bought by Activision Blizzard in 2016. And we've over 2,000 employees spread all around the world. And the team that I'm responsible for is a shared technology team, which is about 450 people based in Stockholm, Barcelona, London, and San Francisco, as well as a number of other locations. So King is well known for Candy Crush, but probably less well known as we've released a number of titles across lots of different platforms, over 200 titles in the history of the company so far. Um, and I, a lot of those titles are still live and they're the titles that are shared technology platform powers. More recently, we started to develop new titles um, and uh, the latest release was Crash Bandicoot on the Run, which is a, a very a 3D title. And this is sort of interesting because it's maybe the first example of us taking advantage of some of the Activision Blizzard IP. Uh, Crash Bandicoot is a historic uh, piece of IP created back in the early PlayStation 1 era. So it was really exciting to be involved in the development of that and the, and the launch of that title earlier this year. So I just wanted to describe first the games and uh, how they're put together and how we think about those games, particularly in terms of being live services. So hopefully many of you will either have played or at least be aware of Candy Crush Saga, which is uh, the number one mobile title, mobile game um, in the, the US at the moment. Uh, super successful game, over 250 million players every month uh, play the game. Uh, and we've got some loyal players who've been playing the game for over a decade. So it's uh, really exciting to be involved in delivering this service. It's a deceptively simple game. At its core, it's a puzzle game, a match three puzzle game. And it's entirely free to play. So the majority of players playing uh, Candy Crush don't pay uh, in order to play the service. Uh, essentially, in match three, you're looking to match three or more candies beside each other to unlock uh, boosters and powers and to, to main, uh, get points. And over time, you start, your skill level increases because the complexity of the levels increase over time. And that's the core thing. People come to play games and to have a challenge. Built on top of that, though, one of the things that King innovated at uh, very early on uh, when developing these titles is the idea of a progression in a puzzle genre. So rather than each puzzle experience being just an isolated event, actually connecting the, the achievement of the solutions to the puzzles over time and to connect them together into a sort of a coherent narrative. We call that the saga. And so we have Candy Crush Saga and Candy Crush Soda Saga. Um, this sort of brings a more longitudinal experience for, for players. So they get a real sense of progression and achievement. And also we can weave in an interesting narrative which changes over time and just keeps that interest going in the game itself. So we think of the games effect effectively at three different levels. One is the core gameplay itself, which is it engages the user to begin with, which is the switcher and the, the puzzle game. We've then got the, the meta game, as it were, which is this progression mechanic, this idea of over time making your way through many, many levels. 
And there are many, many levels. There are over 10,000 levels in Candy Crush uh, released already to date. And we're celebrating our 10K level event uh, later this year. And then on top of that, again, we have the game service itself, which is all the events, the seasonal content, the competitions, the community that we layer on top of the core gameplay experience. So you can think of it as a sort of an onion skin level game with the core, the progression meta, and then finally the sort of community and the event system on the outside of that. And that's what the core platform enables. We think about these games as entertainment services. Um, they're sort of evergreen services where players are continually coming back to play the cool game, but also to interact with the community, to continue to be challenged and to get new events and, and new features exposed to them over time. And obviously we continue to release new levels to keep the game fresh for those players who are our most loyal uh, constituents. So what powers those games? And we have large numbers of, of live titles across many, many different platforms. So fundamentally, we have the shared tech platform, which is what I wanted to talk mostly about today. Uh, with the shared tech platform, we have a core set of services, which can be split largely into our game engine, the game operations tools themselves, our economy management system, which also includes ads and in-app purchasing, the data infrastructure, our data warehouses, our analytics, our A-B testing solutions, and then the core game servers themselves and the databases that we use to keep persistence about the player progression. All of this comes together into a single platform that all of our games sit on top of and communicate with in a constant uh, basis day to day. So we have, as I mentioned, over 250 million players uh, every month, and they send us over 75 billion events per day. And our platform essentially sorts through those events, gets as much observability as we can on what's happening inside the game, and then allows our game teams to operate the games on behalf of our customers, the, the game players, to give them as great an experience as possible. So let's just click in a little bit deeper into some of these uh, areas. The, the game engine is our own proprietary 2D and 3D engine called the Fiction Factory. Uh, it's, it has a long history inside of King. And its superpower, I guess, is its ability to deliver these high definition, these very high quality experiences to the widest possible breadth of platforms and power of devices. This gives us a real great reach. So we can reach pretty much everybody in the planet uh, with the games that, that we deliver. Internally, it's a C++ engine, which is then cross-compiled onto the different platforms that we support. We have our economy management tools. So this is a sophisticated set of tooling that allows us to manage the in-app purchasing because we are a free-to-play game. So we, the, the majority of players don't pay for the service, but we have a subset of our players who do pay and they pay for things like boosters and the cosmetic items and uh, level progression advancements or free lives and things like that. We also have an advertising side of the business, but the economy of the games are really important for us to manage in, in fine grained detail. And this involves setting pricing for items, it involves promotional activities, merchandising, and all the types of things you'd expect in a, in a traditional e-commerce uh, sort of a platform, except this is all for virtual items. Uh, the economies themselves are getting increasingly sophisticated and particularly with our more recent games, the economies are quite deep and have lots of different things that players can purchase or interact with. An example might be the skins uh, that we sell, uh, the cosmetic sort of um, enhancements for the Crash player uh, inside of the Crash Bandicoot game. And there's very, very different skins that are in some cases made available for free, but in some cases are available uh, for purchase inside the game. And I mentioned briefly the ads side of our business. So another important part of our economy is players, we don't necessarily want to pay for uh, any specific item in the game, but are happy to watch an ad in return for maybe a free life or a booster. And in our case, those ads are always opt-in. So no one is forced to watch an ad, but if you wish to make faster progression than you would normally, at the end of a level, for example, if you fail to complete it, then the ad watching gives you, confers you some, some benefit. And that's an increasing part of our business and it's, it's working very well. We've a whole series of live operations tools. Now this is super important because we need to be able to operate the game very effectively over the air, essentially, without having to release new versions of the game client through the app stores, which has a certain latency and friction associated with it. So our goal is to be able to operate a huge amount of the game completely transparently via our internal operations tools. And this can get quite complex because any campaign, you know, multiple campaigns running at any given point in time in the game, these all can interact with each other, with events running, with seasons. So there's a lot, it's essentially managing a calendar of live events for this uh, entertainment platform. And that's exactly how we think about it and operate it. And some of these events are specialized for particular cohorts of our players. Our early life players might see one set of events. 
And our later life players might see a different set of events because, you know, they, they understand the game more and uh, we can have a very differentiated experience depending on how much we played the game historically. So to give you an example of the complexity of these types of live operations, um, uh, a campaign that's running right now in the States is our Candy All Stars campaign. And that brings together very many parts of our company and our operations infrastructure. It includes you know, leaderboards, it includes promotional activities, it includes invite and friendship mechanisms, it includes links actually with TV shows and our marketing department. So a, a huge sort of multi-point um, marketing campaign and event for our players to compete against each other ostensibly to find the best candy player in the US. Really exciting event. And it's one that we ran uh, last year in the UK. So this is something that we're really excited to expand into the US market. But that gives you the, a sense of the type of overlay that sits on top of the core gameplay uh, mechanic itself. Driving all of this is data. So we rely very heavily on observability and knowing what's happening inside the game and how our customers are interacting with the games. So we've got a lot of data coming in. We produce a lot of internal metrics and analytics and reports uh, that we uh, derive insights from. And we're a very heavily A-B testing influenced culture as well. So with our games, given the large numbers of users, we have even small percentage changes in KPIs have a meaningful impact on our business. So we need all the tools that are at our disposal on the statistics side to sift through this data and to look for statistically significant results, um, which can be meaningful for our business. And that's built into the core of how we design. Quickly flicking then, so that's a very quick insight into our games, how they're structured, and some sense of the platform that we're building. Um, and that's what I have responsibility, uh, uh, responsibility for. It's that shared technology platform driving all those capabilities. So to plan, uh, how do we go about prioritization and how do we go about structuring our team to deliver effectively uh, uh, that service? Well, first off, it's the team structure itself. It's the org. And we're essentially organized into six main departments, as it were. And each department has a set of sub-products that they are responsible for. We're sort of implementing a, an inverse Conway, uh, to, to coin a phrase. Really, what we're trying to do is create departments which minimize the dependencies between the departments. So we sort of optimize for the flow of communication. What we have done in configuring ourselves as a B2B organization is have engineering and product management peer-to-peer -peer inside the organization, which I think is potentially slightly unusual, particularly for, for a game company. And more recently, we've been layering on this concept of partner success, which is an equivalent to customer success and something I'll come back to. So what do our product lines look like? I'm not going to get into the details of the products, but we have a broad spectrum of products that all come together into that single platform number of different product areas. And at any given time, we're having to manage this portfolio of products like any product management team. Some products are designated for future investment. So these are the areas where we think we can deliver future value. In some cases, we're in maintenance mode. And in other cases, we're trying to deprecate products which are out of life and maybe we've produced newer versions and we need to move the teams you know, onto those newer versions. So we're constantly balancing all these different product efforts at any given time. The resourcing that we have available to do that is always subject to change as well. We try to track the efforts that we've put in in our teams over time so we can get to understand by team the amount of time that we've managed to put into mission work or new product development work, operational work, which you can think of as maintenance or reacting to issues, and then the unplanned work, which is typically associated with incidents that arise with the, with the service or with third-party partners, or indeed unplanned things that we have to react to with, with changes in legislation or maybe changes in the platforms that, that we support. So taken all together, this gives us a feel for looking forward, how we can extrapolate our capabilities and our resources to plan effectively. Now, who we're servicing is the customers, the internal customers, which are the game teams. And our game teams have quite a, a variety of distribution of size. Candy is our largest internal team. And in some cases, we've got single teams responsible for a multitude of titles. And the games themselves follow a sort of a, a power law curve of scale. So it's quite a challenge for us balancing the needs of all of these different customers in a, in a rational way. But one of the tenets we have is that even though you know, the biggest games are our most important customers. We're developing a shared platform. So we have to always ensure that any capability we introduce can be used by multiples of the teams that, that we're supporting. Now, having said that, it's a nice analogy to compare it to the classic idea of customer discovery. If you're building a, a B2B company and you're looking at sort of early stages to figure out who's the market for my, my product or my service, 
you'll possibly follow you know, Steve Blank and his idea of customer discovery, which is trying to discover those customers that at any given point in time, best pattern match to your current capabilities. So rather than trying to meet the needs of all customers, you're very deliberately choosing customers that map to your current capabilities. And over time, as you have identified those customers, then expand your capabilities and, and expand your market share as a result. So customer discovery is a really important part of B2B growth uh, to grow in a rational and, and, and managed way. For internal customers, you don't get to do that because the customer set is fixed. So you have a different sort of uh, problem. It's not customer discovery, it's sort of min viable product discovery, as it were. What's the minimum set of products that are shared equally across all the different customers. So you're looking for the shape of product that meets as many of the customer's needs as possible, but doesn't get too specialized by the needs of any given customer. So it's essentially an inversion of customer discovery. To do that, when we're going into planning cycles, we try to keep a number of principles in mind. And the first one is that idea of making sure that our services are, and our games become operable and data-driven. We really want all the services that we provide, largely speaking, to be deliverable in a way that doesn't require a client update. That means all these capabilities can be live and operated in real time by the game operators. We're always looking for features and products that have high impact potential, so can drive real business growth in the various game teams, but also high repeatability. Again, that idea, not producing features that are only usable by one given customer. We're looking for differentiated capabilities. If there's a good solution in the market, we want to use that. But we want to put our focus and efforts on areas that we can make a change, that we can actually be more competitive within our existing market. And over time, we're always looking to reduce complexity and fragmentation. Uh, any company of our scale has a legacy and a history, and it's quite a challenge to deal with that and deal with the technical debt and deal with continually moving forward your platform in a way that's coherent. And I guess at the end of the day, we're servicing the idea of minimizing cognitive load of our customers. And by that, I mean, we want a single set of SDKs, we want a single set of APIs, a single platform and a single user experience that's really coherent, that allows our game teams to not only operate efficiently, but also to interoperate, to share between them very efficiently as well. So we get a high degree of transferability of knowledge and skill uh, across the company. So how do we do that? What does the planning actually look like? Well, I guess we kick off as anybody in, in, a, in a larger enterprise with corporate goals being established. And I'm going to talk here about a yearly cadence of planning, which I think is super common. So typically at the start of a year, leadership gets together and defines a set of goals for the company for the next period of time, at least articulating where we hope to be by the end of a subsequent year. This is also informed by longer term strategy, of course, but I'm sort of keeping a lens on the next year just for the purposes of this. So that then informs, in, in my case, my team's platform OKRs. What are the objectives we need to have in order to meet those corporate goals? And I split them into two areas, one thinking about our platform and product, and the other side thinking about the organization or the people or process goals. And they need to be considered you know, at the same time. On the platform side, we're interested in keeping account of our strategy, our technology strategy, and the bets we want to make longer term, as well as maybe the more tactical customer commits and the milestones that our customers, the game teams have for delivery in the subsequent year. These then get cascaded through the organization. It's also really important to have a connection between the two different areas because uh, organizational key result, organizational um, objectives also cost, the cost in terms of resources to implement. So you have to make sure these are considered at the same time. And ultimately, you end up with the outputs of this process, which is your, your roadmaps expressed in some way and also sets of personal goals. And the idea is these, these goals at this level can all link right back to the top level uh, objective set by the company. So what you face as any planner or as any product team uh, going into the start of that year is the, the blank canvas, the really, really scary blank canvas. You've got some idea of a planning horizon, let's just take a year, and you have some idea of resourcing and capacity, which is sort of a dimensionless quality that, that varies by team and by time, uh, and really hard to reason about that. But ultimately, it's our job to fill this void, this blob of time and resource uh, with stuff to do during the year to hit our, first off, objectives. So we'll have framed objectives. So we're trying to meet a certain set of objectives. We have a, a set of customers and requirements and um, aligned responsibilities with those customers to deliver. We also have a product line that exists, the artifacts of, of our efforts. And that product line can largely be broken into areas that we're continuing to maintain and operate and areas of sort of new investment, things we think can drive a, a change in the needle uh, by the end of the year. 
So our goal is to fi- fill this space with stuff, with activity, with work, with resource in order to meet all these goals. And that turns out to be an expression of the knapsack problem in a sense. It's an NP complete problem. So from a complexity perspective, it's not possible to optimize this, but you do a good job of iterating your way towards at least a, a locally optimal or an approximately optimal solution. So here's how we do it. We start off by thinking about our technical debt and we try to allocate a certain resource for, for technical debt. So we keep things moving in terms of our product and we have this progression of a core technology that maps to future needs. We also have an idea of maintenance. And here is any given product as it's in maintenance mode. We know we have a long standing set of requests coming from customers. We have issues that we need to resolve. And specifically for, for maintenance, we like to relate that directly to customer requests, one of our, in this case, three customers. And what we're trying to do here to some extent is to sort of limit the bandwidth that we spend outside of new new product investment. And most companies will have some budget that to try and allocate either for tech debt or for maintenance. In our cases, we, we try to think of something like a 40% rule. This is not science at all, but it's, it's, it's the rule of thumb that we use internally. And then within that, the space that's available is our, our opportunity to move the company towards the objectives that have been specified. So our job then is to fill the rest of the space with our product backlogs, and that's what we do. We try and, you know, we, we communicate, we assemble, we discuss, we argue, and ultimately we come up with some map of the things that we want to do streamed or themed by different product areas, in some cases driven by objectives, and in some cases driven by specific customer needs from time to time. And after all of that effort, we get this beautiful, pristine view of our product roadmap, and we're, we're very excited and, and uh, enthusiastic. Of course, anybody who's been involved in this area knows that that's largely nonsense. And while that is pretty good, you know, the first couple of weeks, over time, things just deviate and just get more and more chaotic as the world happens around us. No plan survives contact with the enemy, is the classic quote. And that's certainly true of product roadmaps. But don't despair. Um, I guess everyone knows what's coming next. We iterate our way towards a solution that is locally optimal. So every, you know, different time epochs, we replan, we reassess where we are in terms of the inputs that have come into the organization and the changes in timings and changes in, uh, changes in resources. And we get something that's closer to a plan that just has a, a staged a sort of resync. We allow it to get out of, out of whack, you know, the space of a quarter, but then we resynchronize it at the end of the quarter. And it's not even as simple as that. That's far too sort of high level of view. In reality, you build a process and a set of communication channels to be much more reactive at different scales in product planning. So in our case, this looks something like we have an annual planning process, which I sort of described. Then every quarter we review that just to sanity check that we have the right objectives still. Are we tracking to our key results and objectives? Uh, are there main resourcing changes we have to make? Or are there big changes in the business that we have to take account of? Then on a monthly cadence, we're looking more at sort of week to week, month to month, sprint to sprint, uh, resource allocations and changes that might have come in from the outside, perhaps a legislation change or something we have to react quickly to. And then, you know, we have our daily behaviors and our daily ceremonies, the stand-ups and all the other activities that give us that very tactical, very high resolution and and very low latency ability to to react to changes that we're seeing. And at at some high level, you can think about this as a a, a multi-resolution view of your implementation. You start off with a very strategic view, the annual view, uh, over time, you evolve towards that very tactical view. And you need to have both or both ends of the spectrum active in your organizations. The annual gives us the directionality where we want to land, and the tactical gives us the ability to react quickly to the reality on the ground. So this is driven by uh, uh, the visibility of what the customer requirements are. And one of the fallacies of internal customers, which is the mode we're in, is that you should have perfect visibility of your customer because they're sat right there. They're right beside you, right? Or they're just in the next room or they're on the floor above you um, or whatever. That sort of breeds a certain sort of familiarity bias, if you want to call that. Particularly as companies grow, sometimes what you rely historically on is interrelationships between people. And this means that your perfect visibility of your customer requirements starts to fragment dramatically over time. So it, reliance on all networks is a problem. It's one of those anti-patterns. You might have had two engineers, one in the product team and one in the game team who had a great relationship and made stuff happen. That works really well until we have a new game team that doesn't have that relationship and suddenly you know, they're out in the cold. That's very tricky. And people move on. And some of these old networks uh, get broken as a result of changes in your teams. 
the non-communication of changes and the implicit assumption that things that have changed in priority in one place will be visible in another place is usually wrong. You have to work very hard to keep track of mutual changes in prioritization and scheduling. So these uncommunicated changes just propagate and build momentum over time. And also within organizations, any sales organization will understand this because you're essentially selling to an org. We also, as an internal uh, organization selling to internal customers, are effectively selling to a customer org as well. And just because we're in the same company doesn't mean that the leadership of that game team is fully understanding or fully aware of what the engineering in that game team is doing. And this is where some of those old networks can really fight against you because while the right thing might be happening at an engineering level, it could be out of whack with what the prioritization from, from leadership is. So that misalignment in the org is something you really have to track. And ultimately, over time, the channels of communication just get too diverse, too many to keep track of at any given time. So you have to put in a rational mechanism for communication. So. One of the things I think I've come away with spent, spending these last two years in King and comparing that to my previous years in, in B2B is alignment. And it's probably the single most important word. It's the word I probably hear most on a day-to-day -day basis is maintaining alignment between us as a product developer internally and our customers essentially as the game teams as our customers. Alignment is super, super important. And this has many dimensions. And from our perspective, the most important alignment is with the game teams themselves, understanding their roadmaps, understanding their release schedules, their projections, and when they're going to need certain capabilities. Because you know, game teams is the lifeblood of the company, and their requirements drive our requirements. There are other areas of alignment. Our technology leadership across games and in the, the central tech solution as well, thinking about tech debt and longer-term platform support. We have our product areas. We need to align between the product areas and resourcing and prioritization. We need to be aligned with the, the overall world outside of us. The legal teams allow us to keep track of changes in legislation and changes in, in uh, the platform requirements. We have the platforms themselves. And by this, I mean, you know, Apple and Google and Facebook and the other platforms that we support. They have a changing regulatory environment and a changing set of requirements that we need to map to. And finally, is our own king leadership and the long-term strategy of the company and what we're trying to achieve. So coming to sort of a conclusion, how do we go about implementing this alignment in an internal uh, product uh, mode. So we use the classic tools of B2B enterprise. We use product management and customer success. Product management is something that we introduced a number of years ago, and it's very, very effective. So we have product areas with product management who are responsible for working with the customers, prioritizing their requirements, developing the use cases and communicating the requirements and the, the prioritization to the engineering teams. And product management and engineering are peer level in our organization. But that introduces its own problem in the sense that we have a large product portfolio and product management without something else is a real problem for, for game teams. If you think about an individual game team, might be a small team, has to maintain multiple points of communication with all these product managers to keep track of what's going on. You can deal with that to some extent through a product management hierarchy, but it's also important to have someone on the inside, essentially. So we built out our account management, our, our customer success team. And these folks work directly with the game teams and keep track of their specific requirements and roadmaps and schedules, and essentially are our, our first warning signal. They aggregate their customer requirements and interact with our product managers to make sure we're, we're all kept informed and on track with their, uh, their schedules. So uh, nearly to conclude, we're configuring ourselves as a B2B enterprise delivery uh, organization. And this is what a, a classic B2B enterprise delivery organization looks like, I think. Engineering, product management. Then you have support account management and solution engineering or solution architecture, which I'm going to loosely call customer success and then sales. So how does that map? We also have engineering. We have support. We've introduced integration engineering, which is the first step towards that customer success capability. And this is all within engineering. And integration engineering allows us to deal with customers that are smaller, that maybe can't keep track of the changes we're making in the platform quite as well, and also does an education job in helping customers adopt new, new technologies. We have product management, which is a, a direct analog in B2B. And then we're introducing and have introduced and are scaling up our partner success organization, which is effectively the equivalent of account management. And that idea of keeping track of customer requirements and very close to their roadmaps and their delivery schedules and representing that within our team. We don't really have the equivalent of sales. Uh, I guess partner success uh, does that. So in conclusion, sort of started out saying, 
have a history in B2B, and now in King, I find myself in a sort of a B2B to C mode, trying to be a B2B organization delivering to an internal set of customers. Just some observations on the relationships between those two. First off, as I mentioned, there's no customer discovery. Uh, all priorities arrive by alignment, and alignment is probably the word I come away with. Uh, that I've learned most about uh, at King is how to align with the internal customers and with a, a larger organization. We don't have a sales renewal cycle and anybody in B2B and particularly in SaaS knows that the renewal is nearly the most important event. The initial sale is important, but actually renewing shows you, you have a scaling and momentum building business. We don't have that. So we rely very much on account management to understand really what is the customer requiring and making sure they can continue to take update versions of our platform. We've no marketing funnel in the sense. There's no SEO or SEM or marketing qualified leads or anything of that nature. So our emphasis is on visibility. Customers, the game teams, really understanding your platform and us then uh, evangelizing the, the sharing of technology and also promoting the adoption of our platform. So we keep all the customers' cognitive load to a minimum and all in the same versions of the systems that we provide. The competition to our internal solution is DIY, rightfully so. So that we try to set this centralization bar super high so that we only share and we only centralize the technology if it's truly something that can be used across multiple game teams. If it's a single game team requirement, then they should have the resources to deliver that. And then finally, the power of shared OKRs is extreme, but you have to watch out for that familiarity bias. Don't assume that the knowledge transfers. You have to work really hard to align on OKRs and uh, to ensure you're on track with your customers. Hopefully that gives you a sense for some of the experiences of trying to deliver solutions inside a, a company like King. And uh, thank you very much.